Hey guys, I am so happy to be here. Uh, I want to say thank you to the organizing committee. Um, uh, you guys are terrific. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I'm sure you're all wondering why <laughs> the first slide is titled Jesse Jenkins. Um, so Jesse is my buddy and uh, has a really good slide deck um, on deep decarbonization. <laughs> Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd steal it for this session. I also um, am in the final throes of finishing a book manuscript and unfortunately did not uh, think it was wise to try and create my own PowerPoint. Um, but frankly, his is better. So I thought I'd spend maybe the first five minutes talking to you guys about what my book's about um, and, and, and how it links into what Cameron brought up as uh, this problem of lock-in, investing in the wrong sorts of things and then finding that you're stuck a couple decades down the line. Um, and then I'd spend the remaining 15 minutes running through Jesse's deck on what it will take to deeply decarbonize the world's energy system. By deep decarbonization, we mean getting our energy system to nearly zero or negative uh, emissions. And the part of deep decarbonization that Jesse's written a lot about and that I write about uh, is in the power sector, uh, where Delavane also has expertise. Um, so I'm going to talk about what it will take to decarbonize the power sector in particular. So let me start by telling you a little bit about my book. Um, I would really appreciate if you could give me a better title than what I have right now. The title is Supercharging Solar Energy. Uh, it sounds, I don't know, kind of lame. It's also a mixed metaphor. Uh, but, but the premise of the book is that solar energy can and should be the most important technology of the 21st century. Uh, it has to be, frankly, if we're going to solve climate change, but also do a bunch of other things like power economic growth in the developing world, increase energy access, and improve energy security in many different countries, uh, from Japan to the United States. And the reason solar is so uniquely important is its technical potential. There is a ton of sunlight. There is over 10,000 times as much sunlight that hits the earth that we actually use. Enough sunlight hits the earth every day than what we use every year. Um, so there's clearly enough sunlight. We can't say that for many other sources. Um, wind power is probably next in line after solar power uh, in terms of its technical potential. Um, but in addition, um, uh, solar power has also come down dramatically in cost and it's looking like it doesn't have uh, political barriers obstructing its rise. So from a technical, economic, and political point of view, solar power could have the best glide path of all the technologies out there. Unfortunately, we are currently not on that glide path. We're not on the right path in solar. And this is kind of contrary to received wisdom. You may have heard a lot of headlines, and I'll run through a couple of them, uh, and we just heard one on the video, that solar has come down in cost so tremendously, we are doing just fine. Actually, we're not. Um, solar, as I'll explain, may be competitive today in certain parts of the world, but that's only because there's very little solar. As soon as you put a lot of solar on the grid, and I argue in my book that we need to have solar contribute one-third of global electricity by mid-century. One-third, it's 2% today. As soon as you have a lot of solar on the grid, it starts to be worth very little. The reason for that is solar energy and wind energy are what are called intermittent non-dispatchable resources. The, those are complicated words. What that means is you can't tell them when to produce. They produce whenever the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. And as a result, if you have a lot of solar panels, all of the solar panels under the same sun will produce at the same time. And that will create an instantaneous excess supply. And the laws of supply and demand tells us that uh, excess supply will drive prices down. So even if a little bit of solar today is quite helpful for an energy system, a lot of solar power two decades from now is not so helpful. Every marginal solar panel you put on the grid will produce electrons that are totally not useful at that time. And so you have this problem where today solar may be cost competitive, tomorrow today's solar panels, even half as cheap or a third as cheap, are not going to be nearly as cost competitive as we need them to be. And so in my book, I argue that solar power needs three kinds of innovation. The first kind of innovation takes existing technology. It's based on silicon solar panels. These silicon panels uh, are largely the same technology as computer chips are based on. They're just like 35 years behind. I'm particularly disdainful of today's silicon technology. Um, the first kind of innovation is taking existing technology as, fast, as far as we can take it. 
And that's going to be for the next decade, maybe two, where this existing technology continues to grow from 2% today to a double digit percentage by 2025 or 2030 of global electricity. And to do that, we're going to need financial and business model innovation. We're going to need to find ways to tap into the deep pockets of institutional investors, like pension funds um, or insurance funds. We currently don't do that very well right now. We also will need ways to uh, use innovative business models to, for example, enable solar panels that are off the grid to power rural households in Africa or India for which those households can pay via mobile. So those are innovative uh, ways to get existing technology out, uh, but this is kind of our path for the next decade or two. Beyond that, we're going to need new technology. So my second kind of innovation is technological innovation. And we can't just wait two decades to then invest in the technological innovation. Like Cameron mentioned, you better do your work up front. We need to invest in technology innovation right now. This is a little self-serving. When I was at Oxford, I worked on, uh, I think, one of the coolest technologies out there. It was invented by a professor here uh, named Henry Snaith. Uh, it's a technology called the solar perovskite. And these perovskites, one day, could be unspooled from an industrial inkjet printer, kind of like newspapers. Um, just to give you a sense of scale of how much solar we're going to need, if you wanted to power the United States with solar, you'd need to build a million solar roofs every day for 40 years. That's how much solar we need. And to get that much solar, you cannot use existing materials, which is basically a pretty expensively processed silicon wafer encased in glass. Instead, you need something like carpet or wallpaper or paint or newspaper. And that's what these new technologies promise. So that's why I argue we should be investing in new technologies. And not just to convert solar energy into electricity, we also need ways to convert solar energy into fuels. There are a lot of uses, like ships, planes, heavy trucks, that just aren't going to be very good on. Heavy trucks might work on electricity. We don't know yet. Um, but ships and planes, uh, it's going to be very hard to electrify those uses. Uh, and so we need fuels. We need clean fuels. Biofuels have this nasty problem where you displace cropland uh, if you do it wrong. Um, and, and, and there aren't very many other options. Solar fuels could be that option. Uh, we have technologies inspired by photosynthesis, which is about 1% efficient at converting sunlight into chemical bonds. And we can do already 10 times better than that. We can do 10% conversion of sun energy into uh, hydrogen fuel. I think we can do twice as good as that, uh, and we can scale it up. So that's another thing to invest in. The third kind of innovation um, is what I call systemic innovation. Actually, is Anisha here? All right, well, um, Anisha studies systemic innovation and, and gave me a much better definition than what's in my book, so I'll have to change it. But um, my definition of systemic innovation was uh, ways of refashioning uh, the world's energy, food, and water systems so that they can tolerate a lot of this unpredictable solar energy. Solar is like the worst energy source ever because it keeps going up and down. Like when a cloud goes overhead, it can fluctuate within minutes or seconds. And there's a diurnal fluctuation because the sun goes up and down every day. And there's a seasonal fluctuation because there's more sun in summer than winter. It's just awful. How can we create flexible energy, food, and water systems that can tolerate, absorb a lot of this unpredictability? That's what I call systemic innovation. And that's my segue into this uh, discussion, which looks at the whole sy uh, power system, at least, and says, what would it take for us to invest a lot in solar power and install a lot more? So that's what my book is about. I hope you will all buy it. Um, it comes out in February. And uh, after I finish this talk and the next one, I have to go finish writing it. Um, <laughs> it's literally, it's due on Tuesday. So um, I now want to quickly walk you through uh, some of these slides on what it will take to get deep uh, decarbonization. This is a cool slide that shows us how technology costs have fallen over the last uh, six, seven years. Um, oh, there's no, oh, here we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Um, this is the one we hear about most often, utility scale solar power. Utility scale means big solar farms. Uh, and it's fallen you know, around 60, 70 percent uh, since 2008. That's pretty good. Uh, the one you hear less about, but which is arguably much more impressive, is LEDs. LEDs have just become free. They're, like, this is a case where I really think um, an, a new clean energy technology, the LED light bulb, 
successfully replaced a first generation clean energy technology, the CFL. Remember when CFLs were a thing? They're not anymore because um, miraculously, LEDs continued to get cheaper and better. By disanalogy, however, new solar technologies have never managed to dislodge uh, silicon solar panels. And that's why I think silicon's stuck here, whereas LEDs are down here. Um, we can do a lot better in solar. A lot of people show this graph and say, check it out, silicon's fallen by more than half. But if you compare that to not only LEDs, but say transistors, transistors have fallen over the same span by a factor of like a million. So uh, I think I did the math. Over the last 50 years, silicon solar panels have fallen in cost a million times slower than computer chip transistors or a gigabyte of memory. Um, and that's pretty embarrassing, frankly. So I know everybody else is talking about how fast solar costs are falling. I like to talk about how slow they're falling. Um, uh, this is a complicated figure. What this is saying is in the United States today, um, uh, coal is not the cheapest electricity source anywhere. Um, that's just a useful figure. I'm not sure what Jesse was going with here, but we'll skip that. All right. A lot of people talk about going 100% renewable. In fact, there's this professor at Stanford um, who argues that we can accomplish 100% renewable energy. And he wrote this big paper in, um, and any of you who are in science will know the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's a very prestigious journal. Um, he got the prize for best paper in PNAS in 2015, saying that 100% renewable energy for the United States is feasible and cost effective. Um, in I think I can say this. Are, are we um, like Chatham House Rules? This hasn't been video recorded. But is it being broadcast anywhere? It's not currently, but it will be on the website. Okay, so I won't say this. But uh, um, let me say that like people are working on uh, rebuttal works, and uh, basically every um, like scientist worth his salt around the world thinks that this work is misleading and dangerous. Um, it is not so simple. Uh, to go 100% renewable energy. Again, I really don't know what Jesse was thinking with the apple and the pizza, um, but I, I, I hope we figure that out. <laughs> so so um, let me try and make the case for why it would be really dumb to try and implement a 100% renewable energy system. This is a common graph that you'll see in the energy policy world. It shows you uh, what the levelized cost of electricity is. This is just a metric that people use to try and compare apples and pizzas. Um, now I understand. <laughs> uh, um, where they've, they've taken all these different kinds of power sources, wind, uh, coal with the carbon emissions captured, nuclear power, natural gas, solar, etc. And they've said, how much does each of them cost? And they've put them all on the same scale. And look at how nice this looks. It looks like solar is cheaper than all of these other things. Um, and frankly, natural gas is probably the only one that uh, is a little better than solar. Um, great, like th this makes you very optimistic, like three out of the lowest cost four resources are renewable, geothermal, wind, and solar. Um, however, this is actually a really bad way to look at uh, things because you are comparing apples and pizzas, that um, solar is something that you pay for up front and then you never pay for it again. A solar panel just sits there and works. Natural gas, however, or coal, you pay for them up front and you pay uh, for ongoing fuel costs. So the economics are, are slightly different. On top of this, solar is intermittent, meaning you can't control when it puts out power, whereas natural gas is dispatchable. It's very flexible. You can ramp it up and down whenever you need it to. That arguably is the largest difference between these sources that is not quantified in this graph. This graph basically tells you, if I were to just count the cost of every unit of energy that comes out of these sources, not taking into account the flexibility value, how would I compare them? And that's what this gives you. It doesn't take into account that very important flexibility value. Um, I'm going to skip, wow, this is, I don't know what's happening. Um, can we scroll down a little bit? Great. Can you guys see this? This is the money slide. It tells you that over the course of a day, what you want is three different kinds of uh, uh, resources. This is actually today's grid, but it'll hold true in the future as well. Today we have what's called baseload, resources that kind of stay on all the time. Coal and nuclear are our preferred baseload sources. Um, this is telling you how much instantaneous energy is coming out. This is telling you uh, what time of the day it is. 
So coal and nuclear give us this constant amount. Then we have these other things, mostly but from natural gas, that kind of go up and down slowly. But because we need the power to go on anytime you flip a switch, we also have these fast acting uh, resources that match up exactly when people all come home from work and turn on their lights or run their dishwashers. This is uh, different kinds of gas turbines uh, or hydropower. So that, that's today's grid, right? And tomorrow's grid is also going to need three different things to work. Um, the three different things are these three. Fuel savers, these are your wind and solar PV. Um, they're clean uh, and they're pretty cheap, um, but you can't control when they turn on. So they're only one third of the solution. You have what used to be called base load, which stayed very constant. We now call flexible base. Nuclear, uh, fossil fuels where you capture the emissions, where you can basically keep them running nearly constantly, but ramp them up and down gently to deal with gentle solar and wind fluctuations. And then you still need your fast acting guys. And this can include batteries. Demand response is not a traditional power plant. It's when people in a coordinated fashion adjust their demand. Like when you and I have a nest thermostat and our nests talk to each other and raise or lower our internal temperature based on what the grid can, uh, can supply or not. These three things are all going to be necessary. You cannot create a cost-effective power system with two of the three or, God forbid, just one of the three, which is what these 100% renewable scenarios try and achieve. Two of the three is what is palatable to many uh, folks in the environmental community. They don't seem to like nuclear. They don't seem to like fossil fuels with carbon capture and sequestration. But cutting out this bottom thing is kind of like trying to solve climate change with one hand tied behind your back. It's a terrible idea. Let me pause, I forgot to give you one piece of context. Also, stop me if I'm going too fast. I've never tried to give this talk before. Um, why do we care so much about the power sector? I don't think I answered that question up front. We care so much about the power sector because if we're going to limit climate change to two degrees, 1.5 is probably off the table, um, but if we're gonna try and limit climate change to two degrees, which also probably is off the table, uh, we need to start with power because it's the easiest one to do. It's also going to be the most rapidly expanding energy carrier. By 2050, the International Energy Agency predicts that electricity will be the most common end use of power compared with, for example, a gallon of gasoline. Right? And so that's the thing that we need to clean up the most because it's growing the fastest. And it's also the thing that we kind of know how to clean up. We have all these cool uh, low carbon resources, nuclear, uh, solar, storage, we, much more needs to be done to uh, create better technologies like newspaper rolls of solar, but we at least have made some progress. In these other sectors, for example, like transportation, we don't have a good way of decarbonizing transportation other than connecting it to the electricity sector. Um, so that's why electricity is, is so important. Most folks say that we're going to have to get to 80 to 100 percent decarbonization of electricity by 2050 if we have any chance of limiting climate change. And by limiting climate change, these guys are just looking at stabilizing the temperature. Temperature might get stabilized at 4 degrees or 3 degrees, but at least to get stabilized somewhere. Um, I, all right, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a sec. Let me quickly tell you about what this looks like if you have the three uh, things we just talked about. Flexible base, fuel savers, and fast acting, whatever he called it, fast rampers. Flexible base, again, largely constant, but it has the ability to go up and down, right? That's really important, that nuclear plants today are not cycled up and down, but they can be. There's no technical reason why they can't be, and this is going to be necessary in the grid of the future. We're also going to have uh, solar and wind that do whatever the heck they want, right? This is totally unpredictable. N not entirely unpredictable. We have weather forecasting, but um, it, it can catch us by surprise. So these guys, orange and yellow, that is uh, wind and solar going up and down. We have no clue what's going on with them. And then we have fast acting rampers. This is demand response or battery storage or hydro storage. And that's kind of making up the difference between this black line and what the other two sources are giving us, flexible base and renewables. So the point of this graph is to tell you that we're not doing a whole lot more than the black line. Anything that's above the black line is charging a battery. We're not doing too much of that, right? We're not investing too much in infrastructure to store excesses or absorb excesses uh, because we have a nicely balanced system. Contrast that, however, with 
the Georgetown basketball team. What? Um, I'm sure he, th this is some teamwork metaphor. Um, so <laughs> contrast that with a case where you cut out your flexible base. If you cut out flexible base, you're now stuck with your solar and wind and your fast rampers. And your fast rampers have to do huge uh, surges of charging and discharging. This is charging, this is discharging. Um, this is a highly inefficient system. This means you're building out all kinds of resources that you wouldn't otherwise have to. It's billions and trillions of dollars of infrastructure that we can't afford. So terrible idea to try and do this. Um, here's the paper that Jesse wrote. You guys should read it. And I'll close by mentioning a couple of the challenges that face deep decarbonization. The first, um, that's why I feel OK uh, using the slide deck. He cited my paper. So this is my paper. Um, and we, I argued that as you have more variable renewables uh, on the system, their marginal value decreases. So this is uh, California. As I have more solar, here's the value to the grid. That gray curve drops off precipitously. It's, uh, 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 solar was worth nine cents back when there was no solar on the grid. And the marginal solar panel is now only worth three cents a kilowatt hour when you have a ton of solar on the grid, 30% to be precise. Um, energy storage, like batteries, help you out a little bit, but not a whole lot. So we saw that declining value curve. It looked kind of like that. And you add some batteries, and now it looks kind of like that. Still declining, just a little less steeply. Um, so if you have a lot of wind and solar, you're going to have to throw a lot of it away. You just won't know what to do with it. At 100%, you throw away 50% of all the energy on the grid. Terrible idea. Uh, at you know, 40 or 60%, we're you know, more reasonable. 40% seems kind of like the sweet spot. Uh, so that may be what we try and target, 40 or 60%. Um, you also need to really uh, expand long distance transmission. The reason is uh, the larger your area is that you can generate over and consume over, uh, the more your variability gets averaged out. And the more you can connect these solar rich regions with demand rich regions. So deserts with cities. Um, if you could connect the entire United States uh, with one grid, one super grid. It looks kind of like this. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but those lines are connecting up. This is a super grid, and we now have DC lines um, that are cost effective or almost cost effective. Then he doesn't tell us what happens. What happens is, um, what happens? What happens is you basically take this amount of curtailment or amount of solar energy that you were going to throw away and you cut it down to zero. So if you connected the whole United States up, you wouldn't have to throw away any energy if you had 60% renewable energy. Now at 100%, even if you connected up the entire United States, you'd go from like 45 to 35. So you'd still throw away a significant amount of energy. Uh, the point is transmission connection can do some, but not everything. You can't be dumb and try and achieve a 100% renewable uh, system. Uh, I will end soon. Um, I'm going to skip that. Final slide. If we got rid of flexible base, here's how much battery storage we'd need. This is one week's worth of US electricity consumption uh, in uh, storage, a, a battery that could store one week. For comparison, today, all of the storage we have, it's mostly large hydro facilities, can store 43 minutes of US electricity consumption. So that is already way more than what we currently have. The range of estimates for how much battery storage we would need is this, between 8 and 16 weeks worth of US electricity consumption. That's how much battery storage we'd need to get to 100% renewable energy. It is a terrible idea, and there's no way we can build that many batteries. It's something like 38 billion Tesla power walls. Not gonna, there are not 38 billion garages in the world. Not going to happen. Um, so I'll end with that. Um, and I. I I would love to, to turn over and go into a discussion. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks, Ruben. That was great. Um, as someone who works in the electric power sector, um, he nailed like, most of the key themes that the industry is facing. Um, and I probably will, um, we're going to open it up for, for Q&A, but I'd be interested in returning on, on a few of them in particular. Um, my group at EPRI actually wrote the first rebuttal that was published as a response in DNAS. Oh, I read it here. It's terrific. Um, my colleagues, John Beislein and Jeff Blanchard. So, 
this idea that you can get to what um, Professor Jacobson calls 100% WWS, wind, water, solar, um, is really uh, enticing. And I, you know, I think in order to meet climate objectives, it's a really nice idea. But um, I almost think that it, it, it puts the kind of conversation at the wrong starting point because, because there are significant technical challenges to that. So let's see, some of the, the notes that, that I was taking as you were talking. Um, I'm really interested in this, this, these new materials that you're describing, particularly for solar. I think, um, and without putting Bill on, on the spot, um, when we think of, of solar power, we think of solar panels that you might be putting on, on your roof. Um, so Bill made a comment to me yesterday during lunch about how you know, his utility in Santa Fe, New Mexico, p &M, was uh, you know, kind of applying all of these extra charges for the solar panels that, that he had installed on, on his roof. And so I was trying to you know, explain how there are additional challenges to both the intermittency um, and also kind of the, the integration. Um, the idea of solar power coming in at the distribution grid as opposed to the bulk transmission system. Um, so I was wondering if you would kind of pick up this piece on some of the new solar technologies, whether it's carpets or, um, you know, kind of roofing materials, and how uh, you see that deploying relative to utility scale solar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me first say that when I think of uh, solar materials that look kind of like carpets or newspaper, I'm not actually assuming that they will be used where newspaper and carpets are used, which is in the residential space connected to a distribution grid. I think these could displace utility scale installations, but the materials are fundamentally different. Today's uh, material of choice, silicon, um, is what's what we call a wafer material. It's highly crystalline. A solar cell's goal is to convert incoming photons into outgoing electrons. Uh, basically each photon, a packet of energy, gets turned into one electron. And the only way to do that really well is to absorb the photons really well and then to be highly crystalline so that the electrons that basically break away from their host atoms can escape. It's like a bumper cars race and they need to get out of the solar cell. Um, the, the reason that silicon works so well at this is silicon is heated up to ungodly temperatures, right? It goes up to above a thousand degrees Celsius or around a thousand degrees Celsius. And at that high temperature, you manage to uh, basically make all the atoms fall into exactly their right place. It becomes highly crystalline. That's why it's so good at this, being this obstacle car race, bumper car race, uh, to get electrons out of the solar cell. What we've done with perovskites, which are these new materials, is almost by accident, we've created a material that you don't need to heat up to ungodly temperatures to make highly crystalline. These perovskites are kind of like salt crystals that remain when you evaporate a tide pool. We basically stick a solution and evaporate the solution, and what's left are these remarkable crystals that are really, really good at having electrons uh, exit the cell and avoid getting stuck in these defects. Um, as a result of not having to heat it up super, super hot, you don't have to make these brittle materials and you can put them on flexible substrates. So we could put these cells on aluminum foil, for example. We could put them on polymers. Polymers otherwise would degrade if you tried to heat them up to those high temperatures. We also don't need to, um, we can use very cheap processing uh, steps. We can basically use printing rather than uh, steps under high vacuum and high temperature. All of these are good for making things like newspapers. Um, and so uh, that's why I'm so encouraged by not only perovskites, but several other uh, types of solar materials. Some are called organic solar materials, and these are similar to what you find in your OLED TV. Others are called quantum dot solar materials. Um, many of these that are really cool, but all fundamentally share this thing where it's really easy to make them. Um, they're quite complex at the nanoscale, um, and arguably, uh, my colleagues at MIT argued that by being so complex at the nanoscale, we've made it much easier at the macro scale to manufacture them. We've done all the hard work uh, in the engineering at the tiny, tiny scales. So, um, I, I forgot your question, but... <laughs> Yes. So, so you can imagine replacing um, existing uh, utility scale installations by just rolling out these carpets of, uh, you know, over deserts of these really cheap materials. 
they may not even need to last very long because you can roll out new carpets on top of them. But on top of that, you might also imagine coating windows with these coatings. Um, they, could, they could look like stained glass. Uh, you might coat other parts of like the built cityscape. Uh, urban areas are really bad at hosting solar because they have high population densities compared to the surface area available for solar irradiation. So you might uh, instead be able to cover like roof facades and you know, all, all kinds of ho home shingles with these solar coatings. Um, so I think they have applications across the range. Yeah, I'd love to dig deeper into this idea of um, batteries and uh, energy uh, storage because it seems that one of the main premises of this idea that we can't do 100% renewable is that it's simply infeasible or too costly to store that amount of energy. Um, and it seems from the way that you've described it that this is uh, based on the current levels of battery um, feasibility of storing energy. But I'm wondering what your sense is on the uh, prospect of innovations in the battery sector that could potentially make it either much more cost effective to do this type of thing or to um, make the batteries themselves more efficient, which then could potentially make it feasible to do 100% renewable. Okay, so keep me honest, I have two kind of things I want to talk about. Um, if I forget the second one, hit me up. So, so the first thing is, let me answer your question about what I believe is the future of battery innovation. So today's battery of choice is the lithium ion battery. That's what everyone talks about. It's what Elon Musk uses in his car. There are many kind of flavors of the lithium ion battery. They differ in the chemistry at one of the two ends of the battery, the cathode, but largely they're like the same principle. Um, lithium ion batteries have been around for about two to three decades. Um, what I worry about is we're kind of getting locked into this one ba battery paradigm, similarly to how we got locked into one solar paradigm where we have a lot of different uses for batteries. We use batteries for our consumer electronics. We use them for our vehicles increasingly. We also even use them for the grid. And yet we try and use the same battery for all three of these things. At base, that battery is a repeating cell of a thing that looks kind of like a double A. Um, surely we can do better than this. So in each of these applications, there are front runner technologies in my opinion. For example, for vehicles, I personally think we will end up replacing lithium ion with what's called lithium sulfur. Um, for those of you who are chemists in the room, that means uh, you replace uh, the anode that's currently graphite with a pure lithium anode. Uh, and, and your goal is to uh, avoid what's called dendrite formation, where the battery creates these like awful little spooky uh, pillars uh, within the battery that cause it to die over time. You want your batteries to last a long time. The reason these are good is they can store a lot more energy for the same unit of mass. You want a light battery so your car is not too heavy, right? Um, for, for the grid, though, we don't really care that much about energy density. We instead care uh, basically about cost per energy, uh, unit of energy storage. And so for that, I believe that the flow battery, this concept uh, that uses these liquid electrolytes to store charge, is the best idea. A flow battery is great because you can increase the energy storage capacity of your battery without having to increase the power discharge capacity. Those two are decoupled. Um, so I, in both cars and uh, the grid, I hope that we replace lithium ion. However, even if lithium ion or these new technologies come down in cost by a tremendous amount, I still think this tells you all you need to know, which is this is like several orders of magnitude above what we currently have. It will take just like extraordinary cost drops um, uh, to make this possible. Uh, I find it hard to wrap my head around what those cost drops would need to be. Uh, as of right now or in the foreseeable future, just no way we're going to accomplish this. What about broadening energy storage to something like That was the second part of my uh, answer. <laughs> she kept me honest. Uh, yes, I, I entirely agree with broadening the definition of energy storage. Um, you know, compressed air uh, depends who you talk to. Some people say that the geological availability of like the right caverns makes it hard to deploy energy, uh, compressed air everywhere. Um, pumped hydro is our biggest source. It's 95% of all energy storage around the world. Um, we should care a little more about that than batteries. Um, but that is also hard to cite sometimes, often for environmental concerns. Um, but even more broadly than storage that, or technologies that like store electrons, there are other ways of achieving storage. 
One of the ways I talked to you about was this one, which is let's put a lot of different resources on the grid. You accomplish the same thing. By having flexible resources that can go up and down, like a nuclear plant that you can ramp up and down, what you're going to accomplish is the same kind of thing as if you had a bunch of batteries on the grid. You're going to compensate for solar's intermittency. But there are even more ways of achieving flexibility, or what I call virtual storage. You may also, we talked about demand response, that's a good way of doing it. Uh, you may also have linkages between the power sector and other sectors. So you can imagine that if you had a bunch of electric vehicles connected to the grid, these would act as mobile batteries if you could recruit them in the right way. Right? Um, if, if, if you don't really care what time exactly during the night your car charges and the grid can control the charging, it may be able to use your car battery as a battery. Um, in addition, we might link the power sector to the heat sector. If we drive electric heat pumps to provide heating, uh, then that is another kind of flexible demand resource that can absorb solar. Since we have a storage medium in the air, it doesn't really matter whether I turn on the thermostat now or half an hour earlier, um, air can basically mediate some of this intermittency. Last two sources, food and water. What if we connected food and water? So we connected irrigation pumps to uh, the power system. Um, well, we actually do that, and that, that causes problems in places like India. But you do this effectively, you might be able to use an uh, a, 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 a irrigation pump that doesn't need to run all the time. It can run whenever there is available surplus renewable electricity. Similarly, a desalination plant to produce fresh water. If you can design this correctly, you might be able to have it absorb some of the intermittency. These are all storage mechanisms. They're just not batteries. That's why I support an expansive definition of storage. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we look at this like 100% renewable energy more as an ideological objective or goal. Um, when you read about systems thinking, uh, Nana Meadows, she says that the third most effective place to intervene in a system is to change the goal of the system. And I see this like renewables versus fossil fuels actually as an ideological debate. So does it have some validity for Jacobs into saying 100% renewable energy is necessary to then maybe arrive at these 60%. You know, is, isn't there a place in the debate for, for that number to inspire change? Maybe knowing that we'll, we won't get there because isn't, isn't it like an illusion anyways to get to 100% in the next, until 2050? Look, those of you who, I, my, my personal philosophy is I stay in my lane. Um, if, if your lane is you study like theories of social change and you think that that's a really good way of achieving social change, then I'll take your word for it. I have no clue whether that's a good strategy. Um, all I can tell you is like the economics and the science tell me that this is a really dumb idea. I'm not um, <coughs> in this sector at all, so my vocabulary won't catch up with it. But bear with me in the sense that I want to pose a question that's troubling. You alluded earlier, and we, we discussed in general, the problem getting locked into technologies that are dead end in some yeah. sense. Yeah. Well, I'm concerned here about getting locked into the notion of the grid as a dead end. That's Wouldn't one of the problems yeah. um, to solve the energy issue be to radically decentralize the capture of solar energy and just get off the grid? In other words, Stop worrying about storage technologies or intermittency or whatever else. Just make sure that on a household level or on any level you want to do it, from uh, neighborhood through to city states or whatever, they become solar sufficient. And then you don't need this whole yeah. um, intermittency problem. The other problem is that it seems to me the um, thrust of what you were suggesting was that we couldn't, it would be stupid, I think you used the word, or at least unwise, to get rid of that third component which seemed to have to do with fossil fuels and nuclear, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the trouble with that is that you're suggesting that we really can't afford to survive. It's too expensive. Um, because we can't afford to get rid of these things which will kill us. It's just not efficient. And here again, I think the, uh, the question of whether human survival is efficient or not isn't the issue. It, it's worth uh, spending, as it were, a lot more than what's efficient in order to continue to survive. So 
I'm pretty sure we're on the same page that the ultimate goal is decarbonization. So if, if that's your proxy for survival, I think we're on the same page about the goal. Uh, I am proposing a way that's more cost effective than another way. In the moment, in the moment, as we count costs. Now, what we're not doing with nuclear, for example, is costing in any of the downstream costs of nuclear. And it's never been, never been calculated. In the United States, we decommissioned the first nuclear power plant in North Adams, uh, Massachusetts, just this last year. Right? We haven't begun to deal with the downstream costs of nuclear. To keep it in the equation at all is hypermyopic. Right? Because we've got tens of thousands of years of downstream <coughs> nuclear. And we're talking about calculations that are being made in months, years, and decades. Yeah. In terms of I, I, uh, fossil I, fuels, at any one point, if you say, you know, um, natural gas is going to still be needed as part of the equation, what you're doing is essentially tying a uh, full third of what you had in that diagram, you know, it's obviously not quantitatively a third, but a, a fuel that you're acknowledging is non-renewable is going to be necessary to keep alive a society which will become not renewable to the extent that it still depends upon that. So it seems to me that either in moving beyond the metaphor of keeping the grid alive, which seems to me in this book is or the metaphor of, well, we can't afford to go to 100% survivable. We can only go 90% survivable or something like that. Okay, um, let, me, let me take your questions in reverse. Um, so, so first I'll assume that we're keeping the grid around, and then for the second part of my answer, I'll, I'll discuss whether we should keep the grid around or not. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I reject the equivalence between um, renewables and survival, but I don't want to litigate that now. Um, I will say, on, on whether we think nuclear is hypermyopic or not, I didn't slow th show this slide, but um, what this slide shows you is, as you go along the x-axis, you're predicting what emission rate you want to get to. This is like reducing half of your emissions, this is reducing all of your emissions. And this is the optimal share of electricity generation from uh, renewable energy, uh, assuming some reasonable projections of how much costs fall by mid-century. And basically what you find is that regardless of how much energy storage you have, you have a peak in how much optimal renewable capacity, somewhere here, around 60% decarbonization. But full decarbonization causes your peak to fall. What this is telling you is that you might be chasing the wrong target if you're aiming for 60% decarbonization. You want to increase your renewables, increase your renewables. But if you're charging 100% decarbonization, you actually want to decrease your renewables and increase your nuclear. Nuclear is super important. Uh, according to all of these economic models, and for the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum studied 18 different studies, they found that uh, across studies, the way to get to deep decarbonization in a cost-effective way does include nuclear. I, I, on a philosophical level, I don't know how to answer the hypermyopic point, but well, the economic this model this tells is us. is not philosophic. It has to do with what you cost in. It's full cost accounting. There's nothing philosophic about nuclear. It's how are you calculating the cost. Right? What's full cost accounting by lopping off nuclear waste? If you're just going to eliminate that from the equation, you're being hypermyopic, right? Okay, so uh, it, it may well be the case that uh, our 18 studies, um, you know, grossly underestimated the cost of nuclear by missing the cost of waste. I personally don't know if any of them considered the cost of waste, but let's assume they didn't. Um, and let's assume, for the sake of argument, that the cost of waste is as expensive as the cost of the reactor. I'd be surprised, but maybe. Um, I bet even if we uh, assumed a 2x sensitivity, we'd still have a large role for nuclear um, in the future. Given that these simulations are telling us that nuclear um, should contribute between 50 and 70% of generation, a 2x cost sensitivity might reduce that. Um, let me quickly answer the first part of the question. So, you know where I stand. Um, nuclear is super important, I am distressed that it's uh, right now in trouble. Um, and by the way, we need new nuclear technologies. Uh, generation four reactors, these were invented back in the 60s. Uh, that can be meltdown proof, can actually have different fuel cycle requirements to your point about waste. They can be cheaper, they could even be modular. You could put them right next to a city because you're not afraid of it 
exploding, and it's also at a reasonable size that it can power a municipality. There are very cool nuclear technologies out there. We need to invest in them. Um, the, the earlier point you made about the grid, um, it may very well be the case that today's um, AC grid is not a good idea. For those of you who don't know this, AC alternating current lost or won out in a war against direct current in the early 20th century. The way this happened, by the way, is Thomas Edison supported DC and Nikola Tesla supported AC. Thomas Edison put cows on an electric fence and electrocuted them to prove that AC was high voltage and dangerous. Uh, he lost. Um, AC did win out, and the reason it won out was because back before we had semiconductors and digital signal processing, we, we could increase and decrease the voltage of an AC current very easily using a device called a transformer, two coils of wire next to each other that use magnetic induction. Today, that's kind of, we have better technology. We can use DC and we can convert the voltage of DC up and down at will. Um, I personally think, to your question, that we're going to want to make the grid both bigger and smaller at the same time. We want to hollow out the kind of AC distribution and transmission grid. We don't need a lot of that. We can deal with microgrids, uh, mini grids that network together communities like neighborhoods or college campuses or military bases, and just connect those together kind of loosely. But I do think that at the macro scale, we need a backbone, a high voltage DC backbone that connects things like the Sahara Desert to the rest of Europe. So I think this hybrid grid that has a huge backbone, a pretty hollowed out middle of the grid that we currently invest a lot in today, and a lot of microgrids, bottom heavy microgrids, is the right way to go. We then get to use our large scale solar and wind resources and our small scale distributed resources. Is that what Epri thinks? Yeah. Not, not, I haven't heard that exact perspective, but I mean, it certainly is supported by a lot of the work that we do. Yeah. I'm smiling because I was enjoying your answer. Hey. Uh, I think we had a question over here. I have a question. Um, the first thing you said is that solar is going to be the most important technology in the 21st century, yeah. and everything subsequently has been about how solar is useless and terrible and all of these caveats. So I'm just confused as to why you wrote a book about how important solar is if you think that actually 70% of the solution is nuclear, and if like there's no way of getting fossil fuel, um, you know, flexible base load or gas peakers or, or whatever off the grid, we just need to invent CCS. So if you do want detailed yeah, yeah. it seems that most of the picture is new nuclear or CCS. Yeah. And then if you have CCS that's effective, which is a necessary assumption for decarbonisation with 50% fossil fuels, yeah. then why wouldn't you just not do renewables at all and just do 100% CCS because CCS, you invented it anyway? Great, great question. Um, there's actually a lot of questions in there, and I think you're, you're nailing it. Um, uh, part of it is um, when I present somebody else's slides, I have to make sure I'm faithful to their slides. But let me tell you what I believe. Quantitatively, my target is for solar to provide one-third of the global power demand by 2050. And by some point between 2050 and 2100, I actually want solar to provide a majority of humanity's energy needs. You may have heard me as a uh, dogmatic believer in like nuclear and CCS, um, but I actually think I'm more ambitious for the role of solar by the end of this century than most others are. When I say that solar should provide a majority of human energy demand, I don't just mean power. I mean transportation, industry. Uh, I even think solar should play a large role in our food and water systems. So by the second half of the century, I really think solar needs to come into its own. By mid-century though, which is honestly the best that we can model, we can't get past that in our models. Um, I don't think solar can do better than 30%. And if it gets to 30%, it will be a dramatic victory. And the only way we get to that 2050 goal is by having these other flexible base resources. Now, if it is the case that we invest a lot of money in developing new nuclear technologies, new CCS technologies, and new solar technologies, and they all work miraculously, right? Um, may it be the case that nuclear should be, you know, Gen 4 nuclear or great CCS technologies should be the way of the future? Maybe. Once we get to that point, we will have, we will have a surfeit of options. I will be very happy to eat my words and say solar is actually not the most important technology. Or, you know, we failed to invent those two, but we made it in solar. We're currently the farthest ahead in solar. We're the, we're the closest to creating newspaper like solar compared to the other things. Um, let's invest in them all. There is no constraint, frankly. Let me tell you how much the world invests in uh, clean energy research and development. Does anyone want to take a guess? Like, how much money does, do the governments of the world invest in clean energy research and development? It's less than $15 billion. It, um, I, 
I really should have a good comparator. I, I don't have a good one. Um, but that is a paltry sum. We could be increasing this by an order of magnitude and still be below, I think, world like health expenditures or world space expenditures. So, or we dog just, food. I mean, you could, just, you could just take a silly one, like dog food. We spend more on dog food than on foreign aid in the United States. Um, and it seems to me that if you really have to bring home some of these comparisons out of the bubble of um, sort of the techno-state factors to see why some of them are transparently absurd. That's a good one. Um, can I just follow yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. You can see why some people might smart at the way that you're talking about this, like you sort of threw out four or five degrees at the start and said we might stabilise at that, but if we stabilise at five degrees, everything's fucked. Like, what is, like, uh, like, so, like, if you start at the carbon budget and you work back from there and you sort of say, well, this is absolutely what we need to do and we will do whatever it takes to get there, irrespective of the costs. Whereas you seem to be starting from, let's like keep energy costs low and whatever happens, happens. That's and right. it seems no, no, like that's well, not... We're uh, coming from the same perspective, which is like, let's reduce emissions as fast as humanly possible. And the fastest as humanly possible we can do it is by not tying our hands behind our back and putting nuclear away. But it's, it's that, it's that's actually not where I'm coming from. Okay. I'm not coming from anywhere. But right. the other the, the other position is <laughs> the other position is we don't reduce emissions as fast as we can. We reduce them as fast as we have to to avoid exceeding this carbon budget. And I'm just wondering if what you're presenting is a compatible. Yes, um, and and the reason is uh, reducing emissions as fast as we can is slower than we have to. Correct. Right. So this, so we all agree. Yeah. So it's not a good picture. No. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's the bigger goal, not just as fast as we can, but as endurably as is possible. Yeah. Okay. And and and, and so, so, so I, I don't really care if the U.S. reduces its emissions by ten percent over the next five years. Like that's nice, but not really. What matters is are we on the right path to by twenty fifty get to eighty to one hundred percent decarbonization of power. And the kinds of things you do for that are different than the kinds of things you might do for a near-term carbon reduction. That's what this slide is trying to tell you. Yeah, but uh, I wanted to. Could you go back to the slide with the three pieces of pie? Yeah, the, the money slide. And I wanted to come back. Yeah, no, I want to come back to the storage. Um, there's three basic problems with solar energy: nighttime, um, synoptic scale weather, cloudy days, and winter. And um, of the three, nighttime seems like the worst because your solar energy obviously goes to zero. Whereas in the other two cases, it goes down by a factor of a third or a half or something like that. So if hypothetically you could store all your solar power for 18 hours, um, how small could you make the blue, uh, the blue wedge? In other words, if you, you know, what's the so, so, so the blue wedge is actually driven by not the diurnal fluctuation. I think the blue edge is driven by the seasonal fluctuation. Well, but, how, well, but the seasonal fluctuation in most parts of the world, like you know, between here and the equator, it's like a half. Yeah, and, and where I live, it's, it's a little less. Okay. Um, but, but also, power demand is higher in summer in a lot of places too, so that that cuts off some of the half. And if you have long distance transmission, like if you can get power from the Sahara to Europe, right. you can reduce right. it to right. some more. So. Um, so my, I'm wondering if you, if you simply um, overbuilt your, your solar by a factor of 20 or 30 percent um, so that you could meet demand in winter, I, I would think you could make the blue edge pretty small, like, like 10 or 20 percent. So I have never, um, I'm, I'm thinking through the models I've seen, I've never seen a blue edge in a model that was genuinely trying to do a no constraints cost optimization. I've never seen a blue edge below a third. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, you know, uh, thinking through the sensitivities you're proposing, like I don't know how that would affect the models I've seen, uh, but I haven't seen it below a third. But, but it, it just seems like if you could store really well for a day, yeah. I, I think you could get you could get eighty percent of the way there. Yeah, um, possible, but presumably, um, what goes into these models is that storing it over a day is pretty expensive. Like that's implicitly considered in the model. For, right, but, 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 but but I, it, it just seems like you could get it's just storing for a day. You could get most of the way there, and I wouldn't even worry about storing on a day in the near term. But but I really focus on. No, I'm, I'm, I'm well. So 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 uh, quickly, I'll say, and then I'll I'll stop talking. Uh, the other way of doing this um, with solar power is to use that third thing, solar thermal, 
So solar thermal power takes concentrating mirrors, heats up something like a molten salt or water to a really high temperature, um, and uses that to run a steam turbine um, or a supercritical CO2 turbine. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. The, the important thing is uh, you can use that heat also for storage. So a solar thermal plant can run for several hours after the sun's gone down. So solar thermal seems... Sorry. It can run 24-7. It is in Spain already. Uh, so I've seen uh, an eight-hour plant. So it kind of cuts out around four or six in the morning. Um, cl close to dawn is um, probably the best you can get with today's technology. We can get to 24-7 if we raise the temperature and use supercritical CO2 cycles, a Brayton cycle. Um, so th there are ways to do this. Uh, and again, they don't use batteries. They use another kind of storage, which is heat storage. But I personally think that's super promising. And just really quickly, because I, I work on the type of models that participate in this energy modeling forum at, at Stanford, and I think the answer lies somewhere between the two of you, and um, the latter type of energy storage, um, solar thermal, is much easier to model. What you're describing, Bill, is, is harder. So Varun mentioned that you know, these models are projecting out to, say, 2035 or 2050, um, and so you have to uh, compromise some of the resolution over the course of, of a year. So um, we tend to think of kind of hours of elect electric demand. That's 8,760 8, hours in a year. You can't possibly model every one of those hours. And so you select kind of a subset that are representative. And sometimes you lose the chronology. So you don't necessarily have um, when the sun is shining storage that you can then kind of use in the next hour that would follow that. Um, so I think that the modeling that informs results like this does not necessarily, um, you know, it, it's something that, that researchers are actively working on, is doing a better job of representing that type of storage. Um, so I think that it'll probably fall somewhere in the middle. We have time for one more question. Um, and I saw your hand go up first. Uh, you mentioned the second last dance of the role that some of these innovative solar technologies may play in uh, the transportation sector. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about some of the innovations that you think might be coming out there in the next decade. And I asked this mostly because I've seen that Facebook meme where they have the road that's covered in the silicon waivers and like charges the cars somehow. So I'm not actually too, um, I do not think that that's super promising. Um, I'll tell you what I do think is promising. I talked about one of the innovations, which is a more energy dense battery. I think that'll be important. The other kind of innovation is, can we have cleaner fuels that are not electricity? One way to do this is to create hydrogen from clean means. Um, and Toyota has a production vehicle that runs off hydrogen. Um, another is to create drop-in liquid replacement fuels. Uh, again, ideally harnessing solar energy or some other renewable source. And recently, over the last year, there's been a lot of progress on using bacteria to help us, basically like a hybrid uh, inorganic plus bacteria uh, device is able to convert solar energy into a wide range of liquid fuels. Some of this work has been done at Harvard, some has been done at Berkeley. Um, both of these options, creating hydrogen or liquid replacement fuels, solve the problem of long recharging times for electric vehicles. And that's really important for consumer adoption. It's also important for cases where you need super high energy density per unit weight. Uh, which um, things like liquid fuels give you that hydrogen may not, so, uh, or, or, or electricity may not. So I, I guess my answer is I have very little faith that putting solar on roadways or putting flexible solar coatings on cars is going to be uh, an important thing in the future. Uh, I have much more faith that in order to decarbonize transportation, we will need new fuel solutions. Electric vehicles may work, but they have... President Obama predicted a million electric vehicles on the road in 2015. We, we were well past that time. Um, and we're nowhere close to a million. Um, and finally, on transportation, I will say it's going to happen slower. Decarbonization is going to happen slower than for power. In the United States, mid-century uh, decarbonization strategy, transportation accounts for, I'm making this up, like, I don't know, less than a third of our emissions today when you take into account land use and agriculture. Um, but in, by 2050, when we decarbonize power first, transportation will account for a large majority of U.S. emissions because it's much harder to decarbonize and will happen in the second half of the century. Thanks for the question. I think the silver lining of transportation is that the capital assets turn over so much more quickly. So yeah. people go through vehicles much more quickly than power plants, which stay in the ground for you know, 
100 years. Um, I want to thank you all for such um, you know, focus and, and attention and great questions that had a lot of, um, of, kind of we obviously care a lot about, about this subject, so I want to appreciate, I want to thank you all for, for your questions. And um, how about a round of applause for Bruno? <laughs> Satisfying way, but you had a lot of, kind of technical detail to um, fill out fill out the answer. So um, I think that maybe we actually have a few more minutes because I haven't heard a bell ring. But um, we're on. Anybody thought of a new title for his book? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? The Solar Revolution. Okay. So great idea. That was written in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> also, by the second nuclear revolution. Nuclear age. <laughs> Shall we get tea? Yeah, let's get tea. Thank you so much. That was really good.